Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to lunch, with folks. Um, as usual, if you would please turn off your cell phones at this point. Thank you. Um, just a couple of plugs for next the next couple of weeks. Uh, Thursday, this Thursday at seven, we'll continue our. People's University Ancient History Series with Rome, Part 1, Period of Kings Through the Republic with Laura Michelle Diener. If you haven't been, the two professors we've had, I think, have been excellent and very enthusiastic, and uh, she'll do a great job. If you're interested in Rome, you don't have to have attended all the programs. You can just come starting this week, and then we'll have the second part of Rome and Pompeii after that. On the 14th, on Valentine's Day, Paul Robeson will be here. This gentleman's name is Marvin Jefferson. He was here before to portray Martin Luther King and did a great job, and I've invited him back. Paul Robeson, of course, uh, was a bass baritone concert artist, and Marvin does sing, he says. Uh, stage and film actor, professional football player, and an activist who became famous for the battle uh, for his sorry, for both his cultural accomplishments and his political stances. Um, and then the following week on the 21st, the Ann Thomas Memorial Lecture continues with uh, Michelle Duster, who is the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells. And I have, we have her two books, two of her books here. This one's only $16, about this is for adults, and this is a children's book for only $12. Uh, I've started selling them early, so if you, you want one, see me after the program. And final plug, we have these t-shirts related to the exhibit upstairs on civic empathy. This is one of my heroes, Harry Jones, who gave the speech. There's parts of the speech on the, program, on the shirt designed by Kyle, and uh, they are $10. So I'll leave this up here if you want to look at it. Limited size is very few left. Today we have our friend John Eric Chillo back with us. He's worked in the field of public history for more than 15 years and is active in numerous historical organizations, a contributing historian at the popular Emerging Civil War blog since 2018. He's been published in books, journals, and magazines. His first book for the Emerging Civil War series, John Brown's Raid, was recently published by Sabbath Beatty, Publishing. We were just talking about he's waiting for the printed to happen. John Eric earned a degree in history from Bethany and a Master of Library and Information Science from Kent State University. Today, he serves as a curator at the Captain Thomas S. B. Grand Army of the Republic Post in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, and works as an archivist and records manager here in Wheeling. He's here to tell us all about the saga of Dangerfield Newby. Here is John Eric Jillo. Hi, everyone. So uh, Sean had some advertisements and commercials there for you, and I have to give you a few as well before we get started. Uh, you know, most days of the week, you can find me just a few blocks from here uh, working as an archivist and a records manager. But on weekends, you could find me in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, just a few miles south of Pittsburgh at the Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall where I am curator at the Captain Thomas Espy Post. Now, of the more than 1,000 libraries that Andrew Carnegie helped to fund all over the world, really, he only endowed five of them. One of those is the Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall. So it has a sense that the building had a sense of permanence to it um, when it was built in 1901. In 1906, the local Grand Army of the Republic Post of Union Civil War veterans went to the library and asked if they could have a room to meet. The library agreed with two stipulations. One was that the veterans themselves pay to outfit this room. So everything that you see here behind me, the carpeting, uh, the woodwork, the furniture, everything was paid for by the veterans. And the other part of the stipulation was that the veterans could have free rent as long as when the last veteran died, that room and all of its contents would be turned over to the library to be preserved as a memorial, as a testament to their sacrifices during the Civil War. 
It's when the last veteran died in uh, the late 1930s. That room was locked and it was promptly forgotten about for about 50 years. And it was reopened in the 1980s as a virtual time capsule. So this was a room where they met for about 30 years. What you don't see um, just outside the photograph, the rest of the walls in there are lined with display cases where the veterans filled them with their uniforms, their arms, accoutrements, artifacts, things that they carried during the war or things that they collected after the war. Everything in there is numbered and identified with uh, uh, information in the veteran's own words as to what that object was, who carried it, who collected it, what makes it significant. So of the uh, about 7,500 locations all over the country and a few international that would have looked something similar to this, the SP post is considered the last remaining intact example of Grand Army of the Republic post. So the post is open. I have a crew of docents that open the room every Saturday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. for guided tours. So I would love for you to come out, see the Captain Thomas SP post, take a look at all the artifacts that these veterans left for us. And we'll be happy to show you around. In addition to that, uh, on the second Saturday of each month, we hold a second Saturday Civil War lecture series. So from January through June and then September through November, uh, we bring in Civil War historians, authors, uh, various types of uh, historians there to come in and speak on various topics relating to the Civil War. So we actually have a talk this Saturday at 1 p.m. in the Lincoln Gallery, which is the room you see Behind these two characters here, they are actually respected Civil War historians, believe it or not. You wouldn't think looking at them. <laughs> but um, so this Saturday, 1 p.m., we have a speaker, a doctoral candidate from WVU, and she will be speaking on uh, the vandalism and, mon and vandalism and destruction of Civil War monuments. Now, we think of that as this uh, recent phenomenon. But actually, uh, her talk will show how the vandalism and destruction of these monuments dates back to the soldiers and the veterans themselves. So that should be an interesting talk. In April, we have a uh, one-day Civil War symposium with five speakers. Um, but just as of last week, that event sold out. Uh, so if anyone's interested in that specifically, five speakers all on uh, the Battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Campaign because this year's 160th anniversary. If anyone is interested, you can stop up after, grab one of my cards, we can put you on a wait list. Um, but otherwise, feel free to come up to any second Saturday lecture. We do get a few people from Wheeling who come up every now and then, and it's always a good time. All right, back to our talk today. So probably most of us have heard of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, right? October 1859, one of the seminal cataclysmic events that really catapulted the United States towards the Civil War. And if we had a visual of that raid, it might be you know, John Brown himself with that kind of flowing white beard and that icy stare, he's a recognizable guy. Or perhaps it might be, uh, my pictures didn't show up there, it might be the fire engine house in the lower town Harper's Ferry uh, where Brown had holed up during the raid with his command and his hostages. But I would contend that next to John Brown, maybe next to the fire engine house, one of the most recognizable images associated with John Brown's raid is this guy, Dangerfield Newby. Um, you know, this is a haunting image. This was taken at a time when having your photographs taken meant something. You know, any one of us could t today can just whip out our phone and click, click, click any number of pictures. It's become almost mindless. But this, this was thought out I and mean, this was composed. This image was made to speak to us across generations. And I'm so glad it survived because this is the only known image of Dangerfield Newby, and you will see it uh, many times today. So you might, you, know, you might not have known who he was, uh, but you might have seen his image before or seen some representation of him. Um, he was portrayed in the recent movie Emperor, came out a few years ago. Uh, Django Unchained, Quentin Tarantino's masterpiece that seems like it's always on television now. Uh, the main character in that movie is loosely based on Dangerfield Newby. He was portrayed in the recent Showtime series, The Good Lord Bird. I don't know if anyone watched that. I loved it, thought it was fantastic. Really uh, kind of remarkable how um, books and movies choose to, you know, where they choose to take their license and then what really obscure history, like in this series, they actually got right. Interesting stuff. He's been used on album covers. There have been at least two bands that have been named after him, the Dangerfield Newbies. He's been portrayed, uh, and he's been the topic of books and artwork. And if you were to type Dangerfield Newbie into Google, you would find that uh, it would come up with about 33,000 results in just a fraction of a second. He has received 
uh, a certain level of uh, fame that he certainly never sought out, definitely never desired, uh, and certainly could have never expected. So before we go on, I will give you just a few disclaimers before we really get into this. One is that I talk fast. I try not to, but I do, so keep up with me. Uh, the second is that later, towards the end of the talk, there are some very graphic, uh, very grisly accounts. If I see some of you out there eating lunch. Let's try to get that digested here before I really get into this. <laughs> and finally, um, I do like to have some humor uh, in my talks. I like to hear the room laughing with me, not at me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for, for our story today, there's just not much humor in it. Um, Dangerfield Newby was just a man who was trying to save his family. And after exhausting all other means, Newby had to go to any means necessary. Even then, probably showing more restraint, uh, certainly than myself, but maybe that any one of us uh, might have shown had we been in his situation. But a story, it's also among the most heart-wrenching, the most tragic of John Brown's raid. Um, in this army that was recruited by John Brown, Dangerfield Newby was the oldest enlistee next to Brown himself. And Newby was fighting for far more personal reasons than the majority of his counterparts who were primarily impressionable young white men. And all of this from a guy who lived just across the river from here in Bridgeport, Ohio. But more than Dangerfield, it's the story of a family and the lengths that that family was willing to go to secure their freedom. Newby again. So here's your spoiler alert. If you don't know how John Brown's raid ended, I will give you a second to put on your earmuffs. All right. On October 18th, 1859, John Brown's raid is over. Uh, Brown is badly wounded in the final assault on uh, the engine house, and he is removed to the neighboring paymaster's office. He's laid on the floor, like you see here, and he's immediately interrogated by Virginia Senator James M. Mason, who was a champion of slavery, and Clement Vallandigham, who was a pro-slavery congressman from Ohio. Now, these two felt that they could use Brown's raid to their political advantage. So while the raid was still going on, they rush over to Harper's Ferry to interrogate Brown about his connections to Ohio abolitionists and politicians, <coughs> men like uh, Joshua Giddings and Ben Wade, these men who had aligned themselves with this burgeoning new Republican party uh, whose platform stood against the expansion of slavery. So Vallandigham asked Brown, you know, where were your men from in Ohio? Were any from the Western Reserve? Were any from Southern Ohio? Brown was in pain from several of, of his wounds. He'd had some serious wounds in the final attack, uh, but he was forthright in his answers. And he replied, quote, yes, I believe one came from below Steubenville, down not far from Wheeling. And Brown was here referring to our subject, Dangerfield Newby. And it was reading this transcript you know, over 20 years ago that tipped me off uh, that one of Brown's men was from my neighborhood. That's what really got me interested. It probably explains a lot that I was spending my high school years reading John Brown read transcripts instead of you know, chasing girls or anything like that. Uh, but Newby had only called you know, our corner of southeastern Ohio here home for a short period of time. Dangerfield Newby was born circa 1820 in Rappahannock County, Virginia, as the son of Henry Newby, a white man, and Elsie Pollard, an enslaved woman from neighboring Fauquier County. Uh, Henry's father, Edward, had built the Newby ancestral home at a place called Newby's Crossroads. Today, that's near present-day Amosville, Virginia, where you see the little Civil War trails markers there, um, in the 1770s. So Henry remained there until 1830 when he sold the property to his brothers, and he moved a little further south to Culpeper County, a place called Gourdvine, a uh, larger property there. As you can see the little arrow on the map there, it takes you down to Gourdvine. Uh, Elsie Pollard, his wife, was approximately 16 years younger than Henry Newby, and she was owned by John Fox, uh, who lived in Fauquier County, the neighboring county over at a place called Fauquier Springs. Now, Fox was one of the largest slaveholders in Fauquier County. He ultimately owned around 200 slaves. And there must have been more than he knew what to do with because he would routinely uh, rent them out, essentially, to work on neighboring farms and plantations or businesses. So we can imagine that that's perhaps how Henry and Elsie met. Now, according to Elsie, she and Henry had apparently married in December 1818. And Dangerfield was the first of at least 11 children born to this couple. Now, even though their father was a white man, 
Uh, Virginia law at that time stipulated that any children born to an interracial couple assumed the race of the mother. So all of the children born to this couple uh, were born as the enslaved property of John Fox. And if you look at the dates here, you, know, you can imagine that this couple perhaps suffered uh, some miscarriages or some infant mortality, which was very common at that time. Uh, specifically, you see some gaps like 1828 to 1832, and then a big gap, 1840 to 1847. But even still, Henry must have worked out an agreement with Fox because we know that Elsie and the children lived with Henry while remaining the property of Fox. Now, interracial marriage was against the law at that time, so it's more likely that they simply lived together as common law husband and wife. But think about that. Here's a white man living in a slave state who marries a slave, raises a large family with her. You would think they were so forward thinking. But Henry was himself a slaveholder, owning at least 17 slaves, according to the 1850 census. Now, some of them may have been his own children who he purchased from John Fox. And we know some of them were his grandchildren who Henry manumitted in September 1858. And now to John Fox's credit, as much credit as we can give a slaveholder, uh, on his death in early 1859, he stipulated in his will that all of his slaves should be freed and good land purchased for them in Ohio. And that's because Virginia law stipulated at that time that freed slaves must find a sponsor or leave the state within one year of their manumission. Fox's estate wasn't actually settled until after the Civil War when his property in Fauquier County was divided up into parcels for his former slaves, or at least those who could still be located at that time. Now, Dangerfield Newby was skilled in the trade of blacksmithing, and he was hired out by John Fox, his owner, to work on the locks at the Rappahannock River Canal. This is in the area down around Fredericksburg, Virginia. At an unknown date, probably 1840 to 1842, he married Harriet Jennings, who was a house slave who belonged to Dr. Lewis A. Jennings, who lived in Fauquier County. Now, between 1843 and 1859, Harriet bore Dangerfield at least seven children, again, all the property of the Jennings family. And again, if you look at the dates here, you can imagine that the couple perhaps suffered some miscarriages or infant mortality. Now, in the fall of 1858, Henry Newby received permission from John Fox to move his wife and his children to Ohio. Now, this is important because Ohio had set a legal precedent only two years earlier. In the case of Anderson versus Poindexter, the Ohio Supreme Court decided in favor of a slave who had been hired out by his owner to work in Ohio. The slave was from Kentucky. But the court said that by establishing a residence in Ohio, uh, that slave had become a free man. The actual language of the ruling said that the chains of slavery would be broken and, quote, crumble to dust when he who has worn them obtains the liberty from his oppressor and is afforded the opportunity of placing his feet upon our shore and breathing the air of freedom. So in going to Ohio, as soon as Elsie and her children cross over the Ohio River here at Wheeling into Bridgeport, they were free. So Henry sold his land in Culpeper County, and he took his family exactly the shortest distance they needed to go to ensure their freedom. And that was to Bridgeport, Belmont County. Now, I can't say for certain what took uh, Henry and his family to Bridgeport, whether he had uh, friends or family or business interests there. That I haven't been, been able to determine. But what's interesting is their journey uh, from Virginia up here to Wheeling almost certainly took them through Harpers Ferry, uh, where Dangerfield would find himself back just one year later. But there was some risk in only going as far as Bridgeport. You know, there had been a slave market located just across the river here in Wheeling. As far as I can tell, the only slave market located north of the Mason-Dixon line. And the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 had empowered slave owners and slave catchers to cross state lines to retrieve their supposedly escaped slaves. And I say supposedly uh, because slave catchers were not above capturing free African-Americans to send south into slavery. If you had, you had seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, Solomon Northup, that's a true story. So we have an account of William Wells Brown, who was himself a fugitive slave and later a prominent abolitionist. Now, Brown visited an African-American family in Short Creek, that's in Harrison County, just across the Harrison County border, very near Belmont County, uh, only a few years before the newbie's arrival. And he recorded, quote, Five or six men went into the house of a colored man by the name of John Wilkinson, broke open the door, knocked down the man and his wife, and beat them severely, and seized their boy, aged 14 years, and carried him off into slavery. After the father of the boy recovered himself, he raised the alarm 
and with the aid of some neighbors, put out in pursuit of the kidnappers and followed them to the river, but they were too late. Brown continues here. The villains crossed the river and passed into Virginia. I visited the afflicted family this morning. When I entered the house, I found the mother seated with her face buried in her hands, weeping for the loss of her child. The mother was much bruised, and the floor was covered in several places with blood. I was compelled to turn aside and weep for the first time since entering into the state. I would that every northern apologist for slavery could have been present to behold the scene. Now, Belmont was primarily an agrarian county that for generations had put their goods to market on the Ohio River as far south as New Orleans. Um, as such, Belmont and the surround, our surrounding area here of uh, southeastern Ohio, they were much more closely aligned to the south and the west than they were to the north and the east. So what does that mean before the Civil War? It means Belmont County was primarily and heavily democratic. It was one of only a handful of counties to vote against Abraham Lincoln, one of only a handful of Ohio counties to vote against Abraham Lincoln in 1860. It was one of even fewer Ohio counties to double down and vote against Lincoln again in 1864. One of the most notorious, uh, prominent co Copperhead newspapers in Ohio during the Civil War, uh, the St. Clairsville Gazette, was published in Belmont County. So being located on that you know, border of North and South during the Civil War, the Ohio River became an international border. Um, but being located on that border, there were certainly communities in Belmont County who were very active on the Underground Railroad. Uh, but even so, it's more likely that the majority of the county was probably not the most welcoming uh, to the formerly or the recently enslaved. And this is where the Newby family put themselves. Now, even though Dangerfield was an adult by this point, Henry brought his son to Ohio with him, thereby gaining Dangerfield's freedom. Obviously a good thing. But what Dangerfield lost in coming to Ohio uh, was his wife and children, who remained in bondage in Virginia. Now, even returning to Virginia to visit his family would have been dangerous for Dangerfield. But we do know that he negotiated a price with Dr. Jennings, supposedly $1,000, to purchase Harriet's freedom. So Dangerfield got to work in Ohio. He worked as a blacksmith. He made the acquaintance of this gentleman you see here, uh, Thomas Thaker from Belmont County, a congressman, who wrote Newby a letter of recommendation. Now, you know, why would Newby have needed a letter of recommendation? Well, we know that escaped slaves would present themselves to some of these sympathetic local congregations, especially the Quakers, and beg for money. And now, Eastern Ohio, Belmont, Jefferson County, you know, there were several significant Quaker communities there, including my hometown of Mount Pleasant. We have one account uh, of a former slave, James Wilkerson, who in March 1858 visited the meeting house at Colerain in Belmont County, just a few miles from Mount Pleasant. Quote, Mr. Le Mr. Wilkerson lectured at the meeting house last night, and I think it was rather good. He gave us a description of his life. He was 21 years a slave. He said he ran away one day and showed us how he looked. He said that he ran till night, and he found a hog trough where he slept. So we know the danger field did the same as James Wilkerson here, lecturing, begging for funds to purchase his wife. And we know that what money he did raise, he uh, deposited in a savings account in a Belmont County bank. And now just a moment ago, I told you that Newby had supposedly uh, agreed to purchase his wife's freedom for $1,000. Because we never knew for certain. All the previous research that has been done on Newby uh, would tell you it was supposedly $1,000. But there's no contract, there's no bill of sale, nothing to fall back on. Was it just Harriet? Was it Harriet and the kids? Was it Harriet and some of the kids? Everyone over the past 160 years, uh, they've probably been referencing a few people who knew Newby, uh, like his brother Gabriel or John Brown's daughter, Annie Brown. Uh, both of them had recalled the price is $1,000. Um, but back in December, I'm really excited about this. You're the first people hearing this. Uh, but back in December, um, local historian Angela Fienerty uh, made the, an amazing discovery in a Caddis newspaper from late 1858 that, as far as I can tell, has been overlooked for the past 164 years. And that's probably because a uh, newbie and Dr. Jennings aren't uh, referenced by name, but Harriet is referenced by name. And there's no question this letter relates to Dangerfield and Harriet Newby. So we don't know the author of this newspaper article, um, but the article did include a transcript of a letter that was written in Caddis on October 1st, 1858. And the author mentions meeting Newby at the Harrison County Fair, where Newby had been begging for money to purchase uh, his wife. 
And to prove this story, Newby produced a letter that was written to him by Dr. Jennings, Harriet's owner, and the author of this article was so disturbed by the contents of this letter that he thought to transcribe it and take it down and eventually see it published. So in this, in this letter, Jennings writes to Newby, quote, Sir, I received your letter asking me if I would sell your wife Harriet and the two youngest children and for how much. I don't think you care much for them or you would not have preferred liberty to staying with them. But if you want to buy them, I will take $1,000 for Harriet, $150 for the babe, and $300 for the other, in all $1,450. You know I am poor and I cannot in justice to my family, to myself and family, take less. How on earth could you raise that sum? If you could, they are better off where they are. But if you like, I will buy you or deposit the money in some bank and send me a certificate of deposit and I will take you, your wife and children. Harriet sends her love. <laughs> now that... That $1,450 is asking about $52,000 in today's money, adjusted to today's inflation. Uh, you can imagine how irate this must have made Newby. You know, Jennings suggesting that Newby could never raise this amount, so he might as well just return to slavery. Um, here's a man at the same age that I am standing before you who had never known freedom and who no <laughs> doubt struggled with this opportunity of gaining his freedom and leaving his family. And on the other side, you have this man who is essentially holding his wife and children hostage, suggesting that Newby just return to slavery if he wants to see them. Yeah, I can't even imagine how this must have made Newby feel. Um, but this is a fascinating, really important letter that Angela found, and I'm thrilled to have been able to share that with you for the first time. But we also know of three letters that were written by Harriet to Dangerfield in Bridgeport in 1859. And taken together, why are all of these letters significant? Well, they tell us both husband and wife could read at a time when the vast majority of the enslaved could not. Now, I've included a few transcripts here, and her spelling is rough, but make no doubt, Harriet is an illustrative writer. Now, the first letter that we know of was written on April 11th, 1859, from Brentsville in Prince William County, Virginia, where the Jennings had relocated. Harriet writes that her master's wife had been ill and that Harriet was serving as a wet nurse. She told her husband that she and the children were well and that she wanted to see him very much and she looked forward to the promised time of his coming. She closed the letter saying, quote, Oh dear Dangerfield, come this fall without fail, money or no money. I want to see you so much. That is the one bright hope I have before me. Harriet wrote again less than two weeks later, imploring that, quote, Dear Dangerfield, you cannot imagine how much I want to see you. Come as soon as you can, for nothing would give me more pleasure than to see you. It is the great comfort I have, thinking of the promised time when you will be there, that blessed hour when I shall see you once more. She told him how their youngest daughter, Lucy, who had been conceived before Dangerfield had left for Ohio, uh, had just started to crawl. So you can imagine how it's just pulling at Newby's heartstrings here. But Newby actually wasn't in... Uh, Bridgeport to receive these letters. He had gone up to northeastern Ohio looking for work as a blacksmith uh, up in Ashtabula County near Cleveland, uh, still trying to raise money to buy Harriet. So his brother, Gabriel, who lived in Bridgeport, would receive these letters and forward them on to Dangerfield in Ashtabula. But by August 1859, Dangerfield Newby could wait no longer. He received a final letter from Harriet dated August 16th, and this letter had a sense of urgency to it. Harriet wrote that, quote, I want you to buy me as soon as possible, for if you do not get me, somebody else will. The servants are very disagree disagreeable. They do all they can to set my mistress against me. She continues, quote, dear husband, you know not the trouble I see. The last two years has been like a troubled dream to me. It is said master is in want of money. If so, I know not what time he may sell me, and then all my bright hopes for the future are blasted. For there has been but one bright hope to cheer me in all my troubles, and that is to be with you. For if I thought I should never see you, this earth would have no charms for me. Do all you can for me, which I have no doubt you will. Write soon and say when you think you can come. Now there's some disagreement as to whether Harriet actually wrote these letters. A later census enumerates Harriet as illiterate. 
So it's possible that uh, she had dictated these letters to someone else or that the enumerator made an error. But regardless, the letters themselves were genuine. Uh, they were found after John Brown's raid in a carpet bag at the Kennedy Farmhouse. They were quickly published the following year by the state of Virginia with other documents relative to the raid. Um, we do have one account that suggests that the original letters were lost in the evacuation of Richmond in April of 1865, but we do still have these transcripts as published by the state of Virginia. And regardless of the author, uh, Dangerfield Newby had raised about $750 of the $1,450 that he needed, and now time was not on his side. You can see an inventory here. It's a little hard to make out. It's not a good scan. An inventory of his estate showing that between December 1858 and March 1859, he had deposited several CDs in a Beaumont Savings Bank. Um, sources disagree with exactly what happened. You know, perhaps Jennings broke off the deal, uh, or there, uh, or he raised the price. Even had been suggested. Um, but regardless, the negotiations between Dangerfield and Jennings broke down. So Dangerfield needed to act now in order to save his family. And it was there in Ashtabula that Dangerfield made the acquaintance of the gentleman who you see here, John Brown Jr., who was then recruiting troops for his father's war against slavery. And we don't have time to go into a fuller background of John Brown, uh, but I'm sure most of you have at least heard of him. John Brown was a radical abolitionist who from a young age had learned to despise slavery. Following the 1837 murder of abolitionist printer Elijah P. Lovejoy, um, Brown rose during a church service and publicly declared that, quote, here before God in the presence of these witnesses from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. And Brown truly made it his life's work. He moved his family to Springfield, Massachusetts, where he founded the League of Gileadites. That was a militant organization uh, aimed at protecting the local African-American community for, from slave catchers. Uh, he met and made the acquaintance with many abolitionist luminaries, people like Frederick Douglass, uh, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth. He later moved up into the Adirondack Mountains in New York and helped to launch an African-American colony there at a place called North Elba. Uh, he really, Brown was a biblical man, and he believed that slavery was an affront to God. He was willing to wage a biblical war, uh, as he said, to, quote, break the jaws of the wicked and pluck the spoils out of his teeth. So at the behest of his sons, Brown actually moved west to Kansas in 1855, where during a period known as Bleeding Kansas, Brown openly battled pro-slavery militants who were intent on seeing Kansas admitted to the Union as a slave state. And for what he's most well known for uh, beyond John Brown's raid, on May 24th, 1856, Brown directed the murder of five pro-slavery men at a place called Pottawatomie Creek. So determined to, as he said, quote, carry the war into Africa or slaveholding states, um, Brown had identified Harper's Ferry as the target uh, of his growing army. And honestly, Harper's Ferry was not a terrible choice. Uh, there were thousands of weapons stored in the federal armory and arsenal there, you see here. Um, there were more than 21,000 slaves in the counties immediately surrounding Harper's Ferry. Uh, and Brown hoped to use the mountainous terrain in this area to launch what he called lightning strikes against slaveholders, where uh, in the dark of night, he would fall on a plantation or a farm, uh, liberate their slaves, and retreat back into the mountains with them. Uh, so Brown had hoped uh, that by stealing slaves, the, from these local plantations that he could destabilize the slave economy in the upper south, uh, make it untenable for slaveholders to risk having their investment there and risk losing them to John Brown. He thought that if he could drive slavery from one county in Virginia, that it would weaken the institution of slavery in the entire state and thereby weaken it throughout the south. So Harper's Ferry would be John Brown's first blow to uh, end slavery in the United States. And if this strike at Harper's Ferry were successful, it would put Dangerfield Newby only about 60 miles away from his wife and his children at Brentsville. So in early July, 1859, Brown rented a farmhouse in Washington County, Maryland, just across the river, just a few miles from Harper's Ferry, and began consolidating his army of recruits. Now Brown's army included only 21 men, that was uh, ranging in age from 21 to 39, including 16 white men, and five African-Americans. And like we had mentioned, Newby was the oldest enlistee next to Brown himself. 
So here you see the uh, Kennedy Farmhouse from an engraving at the time. Here you see the Kennedy Farmhouse today, incredibly moving place, just a few miles from Harper's Ferry. If you find yourself over in the Eastern Panhandle, I would highly suggest a visit, very moving place. So Newby was actually one of the very last enlistees to arrive there at the Kennedy Farmhouse, probably in early September, 1859. But it was here during this time um, that we get a glimpse into Dangerfield Newby, the man. His brother, Gabriel Newby, recalled that Dangerfield was, uh, quote, a quiet man, upright, quick-tempered, and devoted to his family. He never talked much about slavery and kept his intention of joining John Brown to himself. Another source describes Newby as light-skinned and tall for his day, standing about six foot two. John Brown's daughter, Annie Brown, who you see on the left there, um, she had relocated to the Kennedy Farmhouse in the summer of 1859 to care for the men and to keep house and keep up appearances. She recalled Newby as, quote, quiet, sensible, and very unobtrusive, and that he was a, quote, spl splendid light-skinned specimen. She recalled that Newby would get, quote, very low spirited and impatient at what appeared to him to be a long delay in preparation. She recalled that everyone was fond of Newby and would try to cheer him up. And while most of the Raiders were confined to the Kennedy farmhouse day and night, uh, Newby had a bit more freedom and he was able to work at a nearby farm as planning for the raid continued at the farmhouse. But she also recalled that Newby had familiarized himself with a provisional constitution outlined by Brown a year earlier. This was a constitution uh, that would govern Brown's envisioned new state of escaped slaves uh, that, he, that he hoped would take off somewhere in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, but Newby was especially taken with Article 42 of this constitu constitution, uh, which noted that, quote, the marriage relation shall be at all times respected and families kept together as far as possible and broken families encouraged to unite with intelligence offices established for this purpose. So you can see why language like that would really appeal to Newby, who was himself uh, trying to reunite his broken family. Now, there is some reason to believe that uh, Newby was trying to recruit his younger brothers, Gabriel and James, who are then still back here in Bridgeport, uh, to join him at the Kennedy Farmhouse. Uh, sources indicate that both Dangerfield and Gabriel had been active on the Underground Railroad during their time in Ohio. Um, and while Dangerfield wrote to them and encouraged them to join him in Maryland, he did not indicate a purpose and neither one made the trip. So after uh, delays, financial issues, even a near mutiny from his men, on the night of October 16th, 1859, Brown set his plan into motion saying, quote, men, get on your arms, we will proceed to the ferry. And he put his plan, uh, he put his army on the road to destiny. Um, at first, things went well. As you can see on the map here, uh, his men quietly captured the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Bridge uh, leading into town here. Uh, they came down the mountain, came down the uh, Sino Canal towpath, crossed over the bridge, and from here, uh, the men kind of fanned out. Uh, but by you know 11 p.m., uh, they had captured the bridge, they had cut the telegraph uh, wires, they had captured the armory watchmen, and they had possession of the federal armory. So then Brown's men uh, continue to fan out. He sends some uh, over here to the arsenal, Arsenal Square today. That's where the uh, where John Brown's fort is located. It's been moved several times, and that's where it sits today. I sent others here to hold the bridge across the Shenandoah River. Uh, others out here to Hall's Rifle Works on Hall's Island, about a mile from town. And then others uh, he sent out into the countryside uh, to take uh, hostages, including the gentleman you see there, Lewis Washington. He was a great nephew of George Washington, and he was also a cousin to our Wheeling Washingtons. But everything changed about 1.30 the following morning when a Baltimore and Ohio Express train traveling from Wheeling to Baltimore uh, pulled into town. The conductor and his crew uh, were really confused why they hadn't been met by a bridge watchman. So they stopped the train and got out to investigate. On detraining, uh, the crew was met by the night watchman who informed them that he had been attacked on the bridge. Uh, the watchman, the conductor, and the local baggage master, a man by the name of Hayward Shepard, cautiously entered the bridge. So Brown's men stationed on the bridge included his son, Oliver Brown, and William Thompson, who was a brother to Brown's own son-in-law. And these men called out for the train crew to halt. 
The train crew and the baggage master turned around to run out of the bridge and shots rang out and Hayward Shepard was struck just below the heart. The first casualty of John Brown's raid uh, to end slavery, the first casualty of his war against slavery uh, was a local free African-American. So more gunshots started to wake the citizens around Harper's Ferry and riders were sent out to Charlestown and Shepherdstown to put the local militias on notice that some kind of trouble was brewing at the ferry. So while Brown, he offered to let this train pass, uh, the conductor didn't feel like it was safe to go until daylight. He thought that uh, the bridge could be booby-trapped. And so uh, he remained there with the train until 6.30 the following morning. That B&O train from Baltimore, or from Wheeling to Baltimore, is what really ensured John Brown's downfall. Because as soon as the conductor got down the line and found where the telegraphs were still operational at Monocacy Junction, uh, he telegraphed down the line that armed abolitionists had invaded Harper's Ferry. And the stations that were receiving his telegraphs couldn't believe it. They thought he was joking. And he said, I haven't even made it sound half as bad as it actually is. So this was the first alarm to the outside world, outside the immediate Harper's Ferry area, that all was not well. Around 7 a.m., another Harper's Ferry resident, a man by the name of Thomas Borley, uh, was shot and killed while trading fire with Brown's men. And by some accounts, uh, he was shot by a Dangerfield newbie. Another citizen, uh, George Turner, uh, died near the intersection of uh, Shenandoah and High Streets. He still visit there today. His death is also sometimes attributed to Dangerfield newbie. There's a lot of gunfire going on. We can't say for certain. But the citizens of Harper's Ferry were enraged at this point. Uh, to these people just waking up to gunfire, they did not know who these men were, what they were doing in their town, what they wanted. During all of this, Dangerfield Newby had been stationed with Osborne Anderson, another free African-American, and John Brown's son, Oliver, at the Arsenal, Arsenal Square, uh, which is near the entrance to the BNO Covered Bridge. And like I said today, that's where John Brown's fort is located. So angry citizens and militia companies from Charlestown and Shepherdstown began uh, pressing Brown's men. And around noon, several of these companies would launch a coordinated assault on Brown's men. Uh, you had one company from Charlestown, which uh, uh, you see up here, the Jefferson Guards. They actually cross the Potomac River about a mile above Harper's Ferry, and they come down the towpath, the same path that John Brown took entering the town, and they cross over uh, the Baltimore and Ohio Bridge, starting to press Brown's men here. Uh, you also have an attack. Uh, the uh, men from uh, Harper's Ferry crossed over the Shenandoah River and came up trying to push Brown's men in here across the Shenandoah Bridge. You had men from Bolivar who were attacking Brown's men at the Rifle Works, and you had militia uh, from Shepherdstown and Martinsburg who were trying to push down High Street and down the armory yard, kind of hemming in um, Brown's men. So on seeing all of this happen, Brown called in some of his outposts uh, to rally at the armory and drive back this assault. So Newby, Oliver Brown, and Osborne Anderson all went over to the armory and helped repel the assault from the bridge. So while the militiamen uh, did retreat back into the bridge, uh, Brown's lifeline to Maryland and to points north had been severed. So while Newby and Anderson were running across Shenandoah Street back to their outpost at the arsenal, Newby was struck here with a shot in the abdomen. Uh, he collapsed into the street and managed to return fire, but here he was shot for the second time from the upstairs window of a building here on the corner, uh, this building here. And I believe today, if you visit Harper's Ferry, I think that building is home to like the Potomac and Shenandoah wetlands exhibit. Um, but here, you know, Dangerfield Newby became the first casualty of John Brown's a provisional army. The shot, which was apparently a small iron spike, uh, Harpers Ferry was low on ammunition. Brown's men had control of the armory and the arsenal, uh, so these men were firing back with whatever they could find against Newby's men. So uh, apparently a small iron spike struck Newby in the neck, cutting his throat, quote, from ear to ear. Uh, one witness recalled that, quote, I saw his body while it was yet warm as it lay on the pavement in front of the arsenal yard and I never saw on any battlefield a more hideous musket wound than his. Another witness recalled that the wound in Newby's neck was, uh, quote, gaping open quite large enough to admit the forepart of an ordinary sized foot. So at this point, Dangerfield Newby's body 
uh, became something of a morbid spectacle. Uh, you had enraged citizens who dragged Nubi's body. Uh, let's go next. Back here. Uh, who dragged Nubi's body uh, from the spot where he was shot into the alley, which is today known as Hog Alley. You can still visit there, uh, where they had some cover from gunfire. And here in this alley, they began mutilating and dismembering his corpse. Uh, as one newspaper put it, Newby's body was, quote, exposed to every indignity that could be heaped upon it. Uh, his ears and his genitals were cut off as souvenirs. A uh, newspaper correspondent recalled seeing people running sticks into Newby's wound and beating his corpse. Another citizen walked up and fired a shot into Newby's lifeless body while another kicked Newby's face. Uh, his body was afforded no more dignity than, quote, any other dead animal. Another Harpers Ferry resident wrote that, quote, shortly after Newby's death, a hog came up and rooted around the spot where the body lay, and at first appeared unconscious that anything extraordinary should be in its way. After a while, the hog paused and looked at the body, then snuffed around it and put its snout to the dead man's face. Suddenly, the brute was apparently seized with a panic and scampered away as if for dear life. That display of sensibility did not, however, deter others of the same species from crowding around the corpse and almost literally devouring it. A Maryland journalist observed the same scene, writing that, quote, the king of terrors himself could not exceed those hogs in zealous attention to the defunct newbie. They tugged away at him with might and main, and the writer saw one run its snout into the wound and drag out a stringy substance of some kind. It appeared to be very long or elastic, one end being in the hog's mouth and the other in the man's body. I told you it was graphic. I'm sorry. <laughs> So that was the end of Dangerfield Newby, a man who was simply trying to reunite his family. John Brown's raid came to a bloody end the following morning when Brown and his survivors were stormed in the engine house by a detachment of United States Marines led by Colonel Robert E. Lee. Ten of Brown's men were killed during the raid, including Newby. Five escaped from Harper's Ferry and seven, including John Brown, were captured. Now, Brown and his captured compatriots were tried in nearby Charlestown, and they were found guilty of murder, treason, and inciting insurrection. Um, as much as the raid itself, this trial brought the United States even closer to civil war, this was the first trial in the United States, in the United States history that had received national reporting. Um, this was exhaustive newspaper coverage every day uh, that really forced people north and south to take sides on slavery. After John Brown, there was no more remaining ambivalence. This was a white man who was willing to die for slavery. John Brown was hanged on December 2nd, 1859, passing his jailer a note on the way to the gallows reading, quote, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. And here you can see uh, an image of the execution. And if you'll note right down in front here, this image is actually, it's a guy by the name of George Trimble who was from Wheeling. He was a member of the Virginia State Fencibles, also known as the Wheeling Fencibles. Uh, Wheeling had sent two militia companies to be present at the execution. And the Fencibles were given what was considered a position of honor, uh, front row seat here to the execution. And during the course of my research for this book, I found that I had an ancestor who served in the Virginia Fencibles and was present at John Brown's execution. Um, you know, some people write off John Brown, go back here, some people write off John Brown as a fanatic, uh, as a terrorist, maybe that he's even mentally ill. Uh, but whatever you think of him, he was also prophetically accurate. In one year, Abraham Lincoln would be elected president. The southern states would secede from the Union, and the country would see about 750,000 deaths over the resulting four years before slavery was finally purged away. As for Dangerfield Newby, his body was left on the streets of Harpers Ferry until October 19th, when he was buried in an unmarked mass grave along the Shenandoah River with the other Harpers Ferry raiders, where they remained until 1899. Uh, when the grave was quietly disinterred in the dark of night and the remains shipped to North Elba, New York, where they were reburied next to their captain, John Brown. 
But Newbie's story doesn't end with a desecrated corpse in the gutter at Harper's Ferry. When word reached back here to the Upper Ohio Valley that Newbie had been involved in the raid, three men grabbed his brother Gabriel Newbie and nearly beat him to death on the streets of Bridgeport. Uh, these men were arrested, they were fined, and they were sentenced to hard labor with a ball and chain. Uh, one newspaper reported that, quote, it is true, we suppose, that Gabriel Newby is a brother to him who was killed at Harper's Ferry, but we do not believe that fact should operate in any degree as a license to drunken ruffians to beat his brains out. Uh, you see another uh, clipping of a newspaper here, a Democratic newspaper uh, from Belmont County, um, and they say here, uh, before we would condemn anybody for beating one so closely connected by blood to him who has proved a traitor to his country, vice and virtue run through children as close as the family likeness uh, or features. As uh, so you can see, Belmont County was also very uh, divided on what Newby had done. Uh, but we do know from the newspaper uh, that these men were fined at $30 and $17 uh, and had to work that fine off at the rate of 75 cents a day on a ball and chain. That's 40 days and 23 days hard labor on a ball and chain uh, for an attack on a black man in an overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly democratic neighborhood. That gives you an idea of just how vicious uh, this assault must have been. And it's also worth noting that two of these assailants later went on to enlist in the Union Army. We can assume that for their own part, they were not fighting a war for the abolition of slavery. Uh, now, Newby's family carried on uh, Dangerfield's fight for freedom during the Civil War. His brother Gabriel served as a camp servant uh, for the colonel of the 98th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, and Gabriel remained something of a local celebrity until his death in 1900. And I don't have any way to prove it, uh, but I have to wonder if uh, the beating that he took was so vicious and the injuries so severe that it kept him from maybe enlisting as a regular soldier, because we know he had several younger brothers who did enlist. Uh, younger brother James Newby enlisted right here in Wheeling in the 45th United States Colored uh, Volunteer Infantry and served until November 1865. Now, the 45th was the only USCT regiment that was credited to the state of West Virginia during the Civil War. About 300 men uh, en enlisted in West Virginia for that regiment, but the majority of them uh, came over from Ohio at places like Wheeling and Parkersburg and Huntington to enlist here. While the remainder of the regiment were from the Philadelphia area and enlisted at Camp uh, William Penn. Um, younger brothers, John and William Newby, both served in the 5th United States Colored Infantry. John survived the war, uh, while William was wounded at Battle of Petersburg, Virginia, and died of those wounds at a hospital in New York on July 26, 1864. You can see his headstone there at Governor's Island. Dangerfield also had a nephew from Bridgeport, Lafayette Bywater, who served in the 45th USCT. Uh, Newby's sister had married into the Bywater family, and the Bywaters still have descendants living here locally in the Ohio Valley. Um, several of the Newbies, including both of his parents, his father died in 1861 and his mother in 1884, uh, they are buried in Weeks Cemetery, along with his brother Gabriel, and, uh, and Lafayette Bywater and several others. They are buried at Weeks Cemetery on the hill up above Bridgeport. You know, I've looked for years uh, for you know, any vestige of their headstones. I've never been able to find anything, so I have to assume that they are buried in unmarked graves, uh, which is a real shame for that family. And finally, what of Dangerfield's wife and children? Uh, the following year, Harriet Newby's worst dreams were realized when she and several of her children were sold to a plantation in Louisiana. In 1862, Dangerfield's siblings filed suit in Belmont County to recover the money from his estate that was still sitting in the Belmont County Bank where Dangerfield had left it. Now, because his wife and his children had been sold, they were not able to present themselves in Belmont County to contest this suit, and the funds were awarded to his siblings. Harriet later remarried. Uh, she met her new husband, a guy by the name of William Robinson, in a Freedmen's Bureau camp in Louisiana. She had three more children with him. Uh, her husband, her new husband, had been born a slave in Shepherdstown, Virginia, only about a dozen miles from Harper's Ferry. Uh, he almost certainly would have been familiar 
with the raid in which her husband had, her earlier husband had participated. So this couple, they later moved back to Virginia and Fairfax County. Uh, William actually worked as a groundskeeper at Mount Vernon. Harriet died in 1884, and the last surviving child, the last known surviving child of Harriet and Dangerfield died in 1926. That's less than 100 years ago. We have people living in this community right now who were alive at the same time as Dangerfield and Harriet's children. Uh, so we're not so far removed from uh, these people and these events as you might think. But John Brown's raid on Harpers Ferry was, you know, just a cataclysmic event in our nation's history. And Dangerfield Newby was a big part of that story. So now there are many, many local connections, more than everyone realizes, uh, between our local area and John Brown and John Brown's raid. Probably enough to do another program someday, Sean. Um, <laughs> but none of them are more visceral than Dangerfield Newby, who lived here, if only for a short period, and made this area his home. Dangerfield's story demonstrates to us the tremendous cost of slavery. It cost Newby his wife, his children, and ultimately his life. But his story also demonstrates the lengths that one man was willing to go to reunite his family. So I had really wanted to hold off on this talk until I had a book in hand, so I had something to sell all of you. Uh, our book, uh, we just signed off on the uh, final edits a few weeks ago, so it's been given, handed over to the publisher, and the last step is to go to print. Uh, the publisher has it scheduled for a May release. I'm hopeful that we're somewhere in that April, May, June time frame, uh, but you can already find the book on Amazon for pre-order, but I would encourage you to support local publishers uh, like our publisher, Savas Beatty. You can order directly from them or we can make sure Sean brings me back and you can get a copy from me here uh, later this year. Sean was one of the uh, early readers of our books in the early chapters, and so if any uh, errors or typos or anything slipped by, it is entirely uh, Sean's fault. <laughs> but a really interesting book. It, it uh, goes from Brown's birth through his time in Kansas, all of his, uh, his pre-raid activities, we follow the raid from planning uh, through execution. There are, are also uh, two walking tours. There's a walking tour of Lower Town, Harper's Ferry, the sites associated down there, and then a driving tour that takes you to all of the associated sites between the Kennedy Farmhouse and Charlestown and the ex execution site. So I hope everyone will snag a copy when it's available, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Yes, sir. Uh, I've heard somewhere of course, during the Civil War, saw John Brown's body by like some old in the grave. I've heard it, it isn't really that John Brown they're talking about in the song. Really? Um, or the John Brown from Kansas, you know. Do you, do you have any information along those lines? I'm not familiar with that not being the John Brown. Uh, no, that would be news to me. Okay. Any other questions? I was so complete that you, you have no other, okay. Yes, sir. The certificates at the bottom, they don't want to say anything. Yes. To the best we know, they're still there. They're, they're, no, they were awarded to his family uh, in 18, 1862 or early 1863. And what's interesting is if you, uh, oops, let's see if I can go back to that slide. Uh, so if you look at the newspaper notice there, you know, at the top, it lists all of uh, Dangerfield's siblings. And then down here, uh, against uh, Harriet Jennings, and none of Dangerfield's children here are referred to with the last name Newby, again, because they were the enslaved property of Dr. Jennings. So all of these children you see here, uh, Lucy Agnes Jennings, Lucy was the youngest child, uh, Dangerfield Jennings, Gabriel Jennings, named after you know, father and uh, brother, uh, James Kelsey. I can't understand what Kelsey is uh, there. But they, they kept the, uh, the owner's names there. And uh, the family, family did win that suit, and they were awarded the money as uh, Dangerfield's uh, legitimate uh, survivors. Yes, sir? Do you know if the uh, Brown trial was a civil or military court? It was a civil court, yeah. Because I thought, I thought Lincoln's a civil uh, that was a military tribunal for, 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 yes. It was the same. 
No, no, it was a it was a the Jefferson County Circuit Court was in session. So even though you know treason, which we would consider a federal charge, it was a local uh, civil trial. Not, not, not at the federal level, but at the right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Also at the execution, was it John Wilkes uh, Booth there? Yes, you had a lot of a lot of uh, celebrities of that era came. Uh, Stonewall Jackson was there. Uh, Edmund Edwin Ruffin, uh, famed uh, secessionist, he was there. Um, and then, like I said, two companies, uh, two local companies, and uh, there was one additional company, uh, quasi military, probably not a real company, just local guys who were interested, uh, who went over there and were present during the raid. A cavalry company, and I can't remember the name of their captain, uh, but supposedly the last surviving uh, militia man who was alive to witness uh, John Brown's raid, uh, was a member of the Wheeling, Virginia State Fencibles. And I think he ended up somewhere over in Pennsylvania and he lived well into the 1920s. Yes. There, there's a Greenwood Cemetery man who was uh, at, at the execution. Augustus Rolf. Yes. Rolf, okay, Rolf, interesting. Yeah. And, and they portrayed him in, the, um, in one of our cemeteries. Yeah, during the course of my research, so you can still, uh, uh, the State Library of Virginia has all of the records of the Virginia militia uh, who were there, who were present at the execution, and I ordered the Wheeling rosters. Uh, you're, that's how I found my ancestor was there, a guy by the name of George Ellerick, um, later from Belmont County, and then he moved out to Iowa and was captain of a, a infantry company from Iowa during the Civil War. Um, but so we know everyone from Wheeling who was present for Brown's raid, and uh, it's their pay sheets. They were, they were paid by the state for their service at the execution. So we have their pay papers and their uh, uh, their subsistence, their commissary, and stuff like that. So. If I remember correctly, didn't Rolf have, have some recollections that were published somewhere? I think so. I remember. Yeah. There is some limited coverage in the Wheeling newspapers. Um, about the raid, about the company, kind of marching down to the train station. And then uh, uh, they wrote a few letters home from Charlestown. And they talk about sleeping on the pews of a church there in Charlestown and all of the excitement in town and the run up to the uh, execution. And the uh, Fencibles actually, they also marched out to Harper's Ferry and uh, retrieved John Brown's wife. She was allowed to visit Brown the day before the uh, execution, she was not allowed to stay with him and she wasn't even allowed to stay in uh, Charlestown. She had to return to Harper's Ferry where she stayed. So she was not present during the execution, but the Fencibles uh, were given the duty of going out to meet her uh, somewhere around Harper's Ferry and bringing her back to Charlestown and then taking her back to Harper's Ferry. So the, the Fencibles were really involved um, in the execution uh, for better or worse. Yes. Just a comment. Um, John Brown felt that slavery was against God, that our country was founded by a white man who thought it was okay with God. Right, yeah, and Brown was not okay with that. That's why he was. He... I know, but it makes you think about you know, what you choose to believe. You better be careful. Right, yeah, Brown, for Brown, everything went back to the Bible. Uh, he was a Calvinist, he was extremely strict in his religion. And it, it, he could not believe that a country could be founded on such a great evil. So he was willing to do whatever he had to do um, to see slavery stamped out. At one point when he was in Kansas, uh, they had raided into Missouri. They stole a few slaves that, that Brown escorted all the way to Detroit and then on to Chatham, Canada. Um, but uh, uh, one white man, one slave owner was killed during that raid. And it made Brown have a price on his head. I think it was a five thousand uh, dollar price on his head from uh, James Buchanan, president of the United States, and uh, uh, Brown quipped that uh, he would put a fifty cent uh, price on the head of the president for anyone who would bring it to him. So he didn't think he didn't think too much of uh, the president uh, or the federal government who would permit slavery. Well, not a lot of people think a lot about Buchanan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. Did you say that uh, they exhumed those bodies? Uh, that were the mass grave and took them to New York. Right. They, uh, uh, the locals uh, didn't mark the grave in any way. They didn't want these guys to be martyrs. 
Uh, so uh, some gentlemen uh, got together and wanted to see these bodies resumed and moved up to New York as a monument uh, with John Brown. And so they came down and they found a young man. Uh, he was older at that, at that time, but he had, as a young man, he had been present at the time that the uh, bodies were buried. And so he directed them out to the grave and in the dark of night, they exhumed the bodies, put them in a casket and got them on a train before anyone in Harper's Ferry was all the wiser uh, as to what had happened. That's why you saw the men uh, standing there at an empty grave, I presume the next day, but they got them up to, uh, to North Elba and that's where they remain today. Why was John Brown buried there? Uh, that's where his wife and family still lived. Okay. Um, yeah, they still there. And the John Brown house is still there, a monument. Um, I, I have not been to North Elba. It is it is way up there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's where that's where his wife was from when uh, when she uh, conducted his body back from Harper's Ferry up to North Elba. That's where they had him buried. Thank you. Yes. So it is 